you all very much for uh, being here this afternoon and uh, agreeing to go on this journey with Adam and his comments. I've been very fortunate to uh, be pretty close to Adam when he's choreographed and played this kind of role. What he's doing here is a very particular act of mediation, if you like. And what he's essentially attempting to do is to bring the academy within reach of everyday popular culture, and things that make particularly the city Beat to a kind of rhythm that I think many of us who are older have no sense of. And it's a really important job that he, he does that. But he does it as a scholar. So he comes out of uh, English and media studies and is currently uh, an associate professor in film and media studies. Uh, and he's written prolifically uh, in a very conventional medium uh, about these issues of, 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 of popular culture. But it's the way in which he's handled what is for him a really important bridge building exercise between the generations, between uh, aspects of the city, between ways in which uh, people come to speak and express their sense of creativity and so on that I really would like to commend to you. Uh, so, thanks very much, Adam, for uh, doing this. And I'm sure all of you are looking forward to it and saying to me, just go away, go away. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, big welcome and over to you, Adam. Thanks, Professor Sodium. Um, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Before we start, I think I should just introduce um, the artists who will be joining me in, 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 this, in this journey. Um, 20 years ago to this day, I, I became aware of the work of, of the crew for Parks of the City. And um, the album, the third album, Age of Truth, got my attention. Um, I was watching TV one day. I had seen it before, I thought they were awesome as a live act. I liked it more than Black Noise at the time. Don't tell me all that. Um, but essentially, I wasn't really that captivated as I was in the moment that I saw a video called Understand Where I'm Coming From that used so much prohibited art, you know, material, journalistic material, that it was evidence of, of police brutality in townships that really made visible the fact that we were in a state of civil war. And the message was be critical citizens. Don't just Go with messages to reconcile. Be wary of the National Party. Be wary of the people you negotiate with. And when you go and vote, bear this in mind. Be critical. And for this message, they got banned. Music without lyrics on it got banned. Right? This is the sort of situation. I'm watching this video and I'm thinking, this will get banned. How soon it will get banned is another issue. Let me see if I can get this album before it gets pulled from the stores. And I'm literally running around the city. From store to store, dealing with the previous uh, clerk, store clerks getting he bought into a bag being stupid. Flavor of the month, you know, here we go, move on, do something else. 20 years later, I'm still writing about this. And um, one of the final members is here with me today will be my co lecturer, DJ Lady Dean, founder of Profits of the City. <laughs> founder of Profits of the City and Russell Bay Carp. Currently one of the top 30 DJs internationally, top 30 DJs internationally. Uh, we know a number of DJ competitions, not exclusively hip hop, across a number of genres. Um, world travel, possibly better now outside of South Africa than inside South Africa, which is a typical story for South African musicians of color. Um, and then on my night, um, DJ Azor, uh, our DJ for the day, um, he'll be joining us on the panel discussion on Age of Truth on Thursday. DJ Azul, the Neophytes. Star Trek was an MC, right? With the Neophytes. Um, MC became a DJ before long, became uh, a DJ with Gossip and Nicar, taught extensively with them in and outside of the country. 
and works in various uh, hip hop activist projects, youth development projects, along with DJ UD, DJ E20, and also the late Mr. Fat, Mr. Delius, and Lynch artists who've been active over the last two decades. So that's our crew. Today's lecture is going to be about early hip hop and the influence of black consciousness in the South African context. Well, not exclusively, but in the global, the US and South African context, specifically. And um, let's start and talk about its origins. We know this already. Story of, of, of DJs in the South Bronx and the city of places like New York um, in the South Bronx, uh, starting up to pass parties, block parties, etc., etc., et cetera, straight to the West Coast, and so on and so on. Um, but the story behind that is an important story to bear in mind. I'm not going to be late to this, but we are going to come back to this on Wednesday when we talk about gender politics in hip hop. We're going to have to bear this point in mind. And the point is basically this the context within which hip hop artists were operating was one uh, in which you know, poverty in the inner city, in, in, in African American neighborhoods, um, poverty was a real issue. And part of the reason for that is deindustrialization. But then also what some harsh critics might say, you know, the context within which a generation of people after the Black Panthers came to the failure of black nationalism in other words. So two bikes mother would have been a panther um, as black nationalism falls in on itself due to a number of complex reasons. Um, a new sort of generation of people come out of that. So hip hop comes out of that moment. Um, and this is how Michelle Alexander describes it. She sort of brings home the sort of context within which these artists are operating. You see a context where, you know, the, line, the rise of this, this transition of one mode of capitalism to another, the rise of this sort of, excuse me. Um, yes, I'm nervous. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so we see the sort of rise of neoliberal economics, the sort of new version of capitalism. What this means for people working in factories in places like Detroit is those factories are being shut down. They no longer have jobs. The jobs that they need were now being outsourced to places like China, India, etc., etc. So it happens with cars, it certainly is happening with, with, with information technology. It's, it, it's, it's an old story, it's 30, 30, 40 years in the making. So we see all of this happening. So those inner cities, those, those, those cities that, that, that we are in a large labor pool, cheap labor pool, in places like Detroit, for example. Um, <clears throat> there's nothing for them. There's absolutely nothing for them. So that's one part of it. So it's part economics, but the other part of it is we have sort of this conservative backlash, uh, people supporting Republican policy as sort of a backlash to the gains that the Democrats. Uh, the concessions that the Democrats have made to, 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 to black liberation struggles. Right? So you've got that backlash. So that's the important part. And, and what makes Reagan, I didn't even know much about Reagan as a kid, I was standard one, what that's Reagan three. Then Reagan was voted in, and I was like, oh, didn't quite understand why, but I knew this was bad. He was a fabulous actor. What he was able to do is to sort of invoke racial stereotypes, invoke racial thinking without actually using racial language. So this is how we get Tea Party logic in, in, in contemporary America right now. We can have clearly racist actions and discourses uh, circulating in, in the public sphere, but no one is racist. You, know, you can't actually, you know, it's not a clear cut KKK cardboard stereotype on racist um, in, in, in public spaces. So, many of the stereotypes that you can see in gangs like the wealthy queen, the, the crack hoe, uh, the pimp, all of those stereotypes you see in gangs that gets validated, gets, gets sort of uh, taken up um, in the discourse of, of, of the rising gaming air and, and the subsequent Bush air, Bush senior air. So, this is sort of background to, 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 to the story of hip hop. And the reason I'm bringing this up is. is Partly because the elements, because of the elements that they have. And I'm going to stop for a minute and, and, and just ask these questions. Some many people would disagree about this. Some people would say that hip hop is philosophy, and uh, when it comes to everything, it's a way of life. Others would say, no, it's just an art form. Others again would say, it's just music. Um, 
in order to make like this again to defer to Lindy at this point. <laughs> tell me if I should pass. Could you tell us a little bit about five elements? And don't say knowledge of self first. In that order. Yeah. Instinct, <laughs> <laughs> evil, turntablism. And feel free to jump in when turntablism comes up. Um, DJ as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the five elements starting with yeah? Ladies and gentlemen, I was born and raised in District 6. My family were amongst those who forcefully moved or forced out of District 6. We were relocated into Mitchell's Spain. Uh, for me personally, I don't come from a political or activism background. It's through my journey with um, hip hop, with music, with especially parts of the city that kind of um, uh, put me into that stream, if you want to call it that. I've never been a part of a political organization. I've never affiliated myself with any uh, political organizations. So everything has come through experience and sort of getting involved with hip hop as a culture growing up. We start to learn that there's so many similarities in terms of what was happening in the US of A, because that's of course when we've been um, influenced by food, you know, just to cut the long story short. So we could relate to the gang violence, we could relate to the poverty as uh, the years moved on, we could kind of relate to the political aspects and we, we started to get a better understanding um, of the issues and the challenges that we face. So within hip hop, um, let's say there's five major elements in no particular order, the MC, that's the rapper, the master of ceremonies, he or she, um, they are the persons that will get up to the mic, the stories, it can either be fictional, it could be fantasy, it could be truth, it could be from an activism point of view. Um, then we get into the graph of the day. Sorry, I don't know. I see you guys a specific order, please. You can go back, please. Yeah, it's, a, it's a graph art, that's the graffiti art. And um, these artists, they tag walls, they put what they call it hip hop pieces on the walls, or you could bomb the walls, you could throw, do throw ups on the walls. Um, it's, it's very, it becomes very um, competitive and it, kind of, it has its roots within the political environment, it has its roots within gang culture. For me, my encounter with the graffiti was sure, looking at all these really scary um, sort of illustrations on the walls, especially as a kid growing up in District 6 and looking at, at a lot of the characters in the community. And the one was this guy, he looked Asian. He had this uh, sort of um, traditional sort of Chinese hat on, and of course he had Bahabad, and this gang was called the Mongols, and we had the Cobra Kids, and we had the Fancy Boys, and what we've seen on the walls, we only used to see on the arms and the necks and the heads of so many characters. So, learning, once again, um, the similarities between Iraq and its roots in the States, and here in South Africa, and how it's evolved, um, that was another, I would say, reason why a person started to get more intrigued and more deeper um, into, into hip hop. So, the one, the one form, wild style, it's a, it's a very extreme um, style of graffiti. We'll certainly try and get some pics for you to see. I'm not sure if you have any in the slides. No, but I don't need to either. Oh, okay. And this is normally, it's almost like a kind of code that the writers put on the wall. It's got a lot of arrows, it's got a lot of curves, a lot of color. The, the writing is within the writing, within the writing, within the writing. And if you're a well-versed graffiti artist, you'll understand. So maybe one writer might be sending a message, say for instance, a, a writer from Woodstock will be sending a message to a crew in groups where you just play and you put it in the form of wild style. Where you could be communicating with your affiliates elsewhere in the world, could be America, could be in the East, could be in Europe. So this is the depth of um, aerosol art. And then when it comes to throw-ups, this is where writers, if they have feuds, or there's a, a heavy sense of competition between the crews, they'll just throw up over each other's pieces and they'll do this really nasty looking tags and this big sort of bubble stuff, play letters. And then of course the tags, that's a very quick one. I remember the tag was um, that they got the self up, including another two of my friends in Mitchell Square back in 1986. And uh, 
the story kind of goes, we were out there, had no, once again, had no issues, no involvement, no sense of what was happening politically. All we wanted to do was bomb the walls and bring some kind of mutual spray. And then uh, we were putting up this piece called Fresh. And normally we used to write up Fresh, you know, very sort of distinct graph style. And at the end it would be three dots. And the cops rocked up and we couldn't finish the dots in time. And they practically had their guns pointed at us. The one friend managed to do some some sorts of crazy things over a fence of a school yard. Um, this is on um, on uh, Morgan Road in Mitchell's Plain. My one friend managed to get away. Unfortunately, myself and other that we were put in the police van because they said we were communists. We couldn't finish the dots, and it looked like it was double C. C, C, C. <laughs> <laughs> and that took us for one of the wildest rides that you can imagine. In the back of the police van, they made sure that the shakers are out and we were flying all over the place. And uh, the, the real, um, I would say the sad part of the story is we were taken to Mitchell's Plain Police Station and getting in mind, we're kind of going into the state of emergencies right now where all these um, uh, boat boats and caspers and armies used to come in. And it was about 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, and we actually had to walk home because I lived down in Dentegia, which is like a 20, half an hour walk from which was my town center, so we could walk past all these gang territories. And normally boys coming from the one side of Mitchell Spring, you can't just freely walk or operate, you just go as you please into other areas in that time of the night. And those were stages where gang activity was at the whole time high. So that's just a little bit of... <laughs> And that's perfect. Yes. So, many people who don't know much about black are oh, confused with gang graffiti. But it's actually the opposite, isn't it? The opposite is a different thing. Um, I would say so, you know, uh, I would say yes and no. It can, and it can be related to gang culture as well. Because there's many gangsters that have embraced hip hop as a culture for whatever means they chose or choose. And unfortunately, they use the various art forms. Well, they use the various elements to convey their messages as well. So they kind of bring, if you want to call it, their swag or their flavor or their interpretation and their sort of thinking into the culture. So there is like a sense, you know, of, if you want to call it, the, the culture now being deleted by those forces as well. The same as it is, you know, in so many other. Like, so you like mural in, 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 in Manenberg. In Manenberg, that's, that's a perfect example. The hard livings. Um, they put up this huge um, mural, Tupac mural, in Manilwood because they became fans of Tupac. And if you look at what Tupac had to say, what, uh, what, what he had to say, what he stood for, um, it was totally, I think to a certain extent, contradictory. But I think what turned it on was the fact that Tupac released songs called Hit Em Up. And this was like a disc that went out to East Coast rapper Biggie Smalls. And um, there was that kind of bred a huge East Coast West Coast feud that practically went out across the world and unfortunately our communities were caught up in that as well because now you had kids in the Woodstock area they kind of went with the, with the, with the East Coast sort of gangs because Biggie Smalls, well, he formed a group called Junior Mafias so we had Junior Mafias in Woodstock that would go to war with the HLs and everyone else that were fans of West Coast uh, rappers like uh, Tupac Shakur and you know, his click. So unfortunately, you know, we got caught in the crossfire of all that madness as well. Interesting. We'll come back to that issue when we talk about globalization and gender politics in relation to gangster. But for now, in scene, um, do you want to talk to that or should I, should I shoot to that myself? Um, you may. Um, Okay, so in scene, um, do you have any reasons, your arguments for against the culture of the Indian and peace? Many people look at hip hop and the narrative that that really just often might have you thinking, oh well, you see, gangsters in Cape Town are irritating, gangster rappers from the States, and it's, it's, it just validates the culture of the Indian and peace. People just imitating what they see on MTV and BET. But the fact is, when it comes to in scene, there are arguments for our tradition being very much alive, our tradition that you, that you get coming out of Africa inspired what happened in, 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 in the diaspora. So by the time people, enslaved people, were taken from the West Coast of Africa, they took with them various aspects of, 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 
the culture, of the tradition, and oral culture, and, and, and mythology is really much a part of that. I mean, it's a lot of this, but I do think you should check out Andy Louis Gex's second part, The Second Part of Working, and the book Fingers of Black. Because that, to me, when, when I was doing my MA research long ago, long, long ago, that was the bridge between my interest in oral poetry and its famous poetry in some African context and its, and its, and its sort of, to, you know, tradition of protest culture and ownership informing this performance, that tradition meeting up with the oral culture of, 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 of hip hop. So there's already a lot of momentum here when it comes to the big sort of clever use, the double coded use of language, uh, playing with different dialects of, 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 of languages as well as uh, the, you know, the dominant hegemonic language is English and Afrikaans in, 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 in this sort of African context. So we really have seen parallels between, between the other traditions in, this African, in the African context and that of the US. And this is obviously what made a lot of sense to a lot of people who were already involved in caught up in the state of the emergency of apart education. They would use any means that could to make sense of reality and, and actually vocalize. Uh, resistance, um, just vocalize the creativity. So that's an interesting that we can come back to that in discussion time again. I'm rushing into turntablism, and I'd like, is it possible for us to tell us a little bit about turntablism and the approach to what makes this hip hop? That's a good question. But far, I say, the buck is good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, turntablism, uh, the art of being a DJ. Uh, the, the art of being a hip hop DJ, it's been quite a, I would say, very interesting journey and, quite, uh, and one that's quite uh, intense. And for me, the thing that, that really sort of captivated me was the fact that I never ever dreamed or imagined that a turntable or a phonogram could become a musical instrument and the way people would use the black plastic to manipulate the sounds is completely mind-blowing. You know, the turntables or the phonograms were invented sort of short. If I stand to be corrected, it goes back as far as the 1910s and 20s. It's evolved from there. So many DJs have come through the various eras. There's been so many different sort of interpretations. And just the fact that uh, hip-hop DJs, they kind of push the envelope when it comes to turntablism. And names such as Africa Mombata, uh, uh, Grand, um, Grandmaster Flash, DJ Kula. A lot of people say the history goes back to Kula, the DJ from, uh, originally from Jamaica. He's moved to the South Bronx and he sort of brought the, the Jamaican form of DJ to the US and these guys used to have this huge sound system battles where one uh, crew would set up a sound system on the one side of the park and another crew would set up another sound system and then these guys used to go back and forth and try and battle each other to see who had the biggest sound system and um, there would be different sort of Jamaican chants that would go over the music and then DJs such as Grandmaster Flash, Lovebox Starsky, there's a huge list of names um, you know, that you can throw at you at the time, fast when you go through this as quickly as possible. People said that a DJ called Grand was a theater where he stumbled upon, upon scratching. Now that came to be, the music was playing loud in his room, his mom came rushing through the door and she was like, put that rubbish off, blah, 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 and she was going on and he stopped the, he stopped the record in, in his headphones and while his mom was busy, you know, having a few words with him, he was busy queuing up the record in his headset and moving the record back and forth. And that's exactly the sound that, uh, that, uh, that he was listening to. And once his mom had left the room, he immediately jumped into that and that is something that he, um, he kind of landed on and he developed that. Then we have another story from a gentleman known as Grandmaster Flash and uh, his story is slightly different to uh, Grandmaster Theodore. So unfortunately we're at this point now where it's debatable as to who invented the, the scratch. Grandmaster Flash, um, his story is he locked himself up in his room for three years. He managed. He studied electronics. He managed to find a way 
um, to put a headphone switch and other little functions onto the sound mixer and through this he developed certain methods. After spending three years developing that, those techniques in his room, he brought it out into the, into the park jams. He used to have a lot of functions in park jams. And apparently, after his first gig, everybody booed him because it sounded like he was messing up the music. People didn't quite understand it. But it evolved from there. So, fast forward through to um, the 90s through to 2000, this is where turntablism sort of evolved. There was various championships held around the world. So, I'm just going to demonstrate some of the techniques very quickly. So, we're taking recorded music and we're practically manipulating it. So, we have the turntable, we have the mixer, and these days with all the new technology, we use laptops, it's very fancy um, record boxes, and we can pack all our effects units, and there's a whole lot of other really wonderful things that we can do with this. So, we're just going to take it through some of the basics. DJ so if you could just uh, play the sound um, of scratch. That's it that becomes the traditional sound that turntables the DJs have used through the ages. And uh, by manipulating this, we, we, we have names for certain techniques. So this is what's known as the baby scratch. And now we can evolve the baby scratch and we can turn it into something known as the military scratch by incorporating the crossfader. And now we'll move on to a scratch known as the Transformer Scratch. And this, yes, ladies and gentlemen, was inspired by the movie Transformers. In fact, before the movie, it, there was a cartoon series in the, in the 80s, I think it was, and um, Will Smith's DJ Jazzy Jeff is the guy that made this technique popular around the world. I think we're going to leave it there, so that kind of gives you an idea of turntablism. So we'll take those sounds, we'll then put that on top of, um, sort of, we'll, we'll put it on top of other tracks as various technical um, mixing um, techniques built into that as well. <laughs> Excuse me, oh, he's, he's hustling me to, to jump on the deck. So then, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do, is it okay if we do a two minute jam session? <laughs> so we just demonstrate some of the techniques. You can see some funny things on the way the sound was transformed. We're chopping it into a little
What are they doing with commodity? They do they, they you know what it means, what this thing means. You use the spray can to spray paint your car, your furniture, etc., etc. Et they go to public space and they claim that public space. What is the context within which we're operating? The rise of paganism, right? the collapse of the industry, deindustrialization. Basically, people of color being dislocated from the land, being disenfranchised. They might have a vote in theory, but the prisons are filling up, public spending on healthcare, on education, safe parks for kids to go, all of these things are going down. And at the same time, there are theories that, you know, intelligence has flooded the streets with crap to diffuse the black nationalism, to diffuse the black families. So all of this stuff is going down. People are dislocated. So you need to actually find a way to reclaim public space. So gap artists are reclaiming public space, Africa Bombata, DJ Paul Hurt, and all of these artists are using these commodities, they're speaking through them, and they're producing messages that are counter-discursive, they're counter-hegemonic. They're reinventing what the word vinyl means. Much like the MCs would reinvent the language, the slave master's language, English, you would repurpose it. You claim it and you subvert it. Okay? And this is where double coded modes of speech comes from. Parallel discursive universes is what Henry Louis Gates would call it. Most they make different second Henry Louis Gates. Um, Henry Louis Gates. Um, and this is what it means. So the sign vinyl might mean something in mainstream hegemonic discourse, but to a hip hop artist, it gets retooled, repurposed, it gets reinvented. So this is how you have these parallel discursive universes. And aesthetic definitions also get redefined because you might have DJs coming into a studio which traditionally would have worked with white male rock artists. Those artists would get upset because now you have these engineers, these MCs, these producers coming in and they're, 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 they're killing the equipment, they're destroying it. You're going to blow our system. Now you're going to go blow our PA system. So this is an old story. These hip hop artists are screwing up our stuff. There's too much rupture, there's too much noise, there's too much bass, it's distorted. Oh, you know, so it's, it becomes, it's, it's an aesthetic battle, but it's actually political. So who defines what is aesthetically beautiful, right? What is, what, who defines what you may do in public space? So I'm going to go back to draft. So bombing walls, tagging, etc., etc., whether it was the apartheid context, or whether it was the South Bronx in 1978, the same issue. Whose space is this? Are we not citizens? Can we claim the space to be creative, etc., etc., be fully human? Right? So this is the story, this is what informs it. So you reinvent this commodity. To get which we say subcultures are each can't be Why are they can't be How does it happen? They, they do it through style. They speak through commodities, they reinvent them. And of course, if that is true, commodities are commodities that can be co-opted commercially. So, so bear that in mind. And we'll come back to that. B-boy, we don't have a uh, Do you want to? No. So we want to do the same thing, they're intertextual, now think about it. What they did was incredibly intertextual, they've got a vacuum track, it could be samples from a million places. They've got some vinyls, tracks up here, and it's incredibly intertextual. There's so many texts that they could bring in, a beat from here, uh, a sample from, from wherever, something from a movie, something from a TV thing, something that is recorded live and incorporated. All range of things. So this is the most this is the, the ultimate postmodern approach to making music. It's live, it's ephemeral, can't always be exactly reproduced in the same way, but when you can maybe it can. There's always that sort of difference, that slippage, right? So B boys do the same thing with their bodies. And they reference all of these intertextual things. But if you go over our prophets of the city were here, you would say that a lot of uh, B-boys were inspired by, by, by manga, by cartoons, right? by kung fu, by science fiction, by a range of things, not necessarily thought of as dance. So they invent what, what dance means, what does it mean to, to move with your body, to speak to your body. It can be intertextual, but also appropriates that sign, dance, and in, introduces alternate meanings. So which brings us to the question of knowledge of self. And I'm going to refer to AD at this point because the quote that I'm about to offer you is actually from Prophets of the City, so we'll get it in the final event to talk about this. 
Um, so what does the password messages mean? It would say it was knowledge itself. All of these different elements, it could have been skateboarding, it could have been anything. But the thing that makes PPOC E is knowledge itself, it's the glue that brings all of these elements together. So what, is, what does this mean? So on one level they're drawing on Eastern philosophies. But the most tangible philosophy that they're drawing on is black consciousness. Those black nationalist narratives of previous generations still continue to be influenced there. So the late Ali Balaka, for example, definitely would be counted as an influence on MCs. Gil Scott Heron, Al K. J. in the UK, a range of poets, dub poets, performance poets, like everyone called them influencing this emerging MCs and DJs, etc. etc. So what is it there? There's, there's a sort of a, an attempt to, to reintroduce, to, to challenge uh, colonial thinking and what it means to be black. So the first sort of most obvious US example would be public enemies fight the power. And if you haven't seen the film Do the Right Thing by Spike Lee, it's, you know, it's a staple. Um, here you have the message coming through loud and clear about how hip hop is used to disrupt a space, to claim it, to make noise, to disturb people, to break it, to disturb the peace, literally, on a sonic level, that to rupture. I mean, on an ideological level as well, to challenge, in this instance, what it means to be American. What does American nationalism mean? It's a white supremacist nationalist narrative. And what are we going to do? What, what are we going to do to drive that point home? We're going to take some of the most sacrosanct icons from that time, from the 80s, and we're going to violate them for you. We're going to appropriate them. So, my favorite part of the song, Elvis was a to most, but he never made shit to me. <coughs> Straight up racist, that sucker was simple and plain, motherfucking and John Wayne. Okay, I'm going to start there. Why Elvis, the king of rock and roll, gave you deep? Why Elvis? Why why Elvis? Um, I think because of, of Elvis's status at the time. And um, there are a lot of people, when you think of Elvis, um, you, you think that Elvis was the person that actually, he, he was actually being credited or elevated to a point where people actually believe that he was the founder or the creator of rock and roll music, whereas those um, that have been there, you know, Chuck uh, um, exactly, you know, all those artists, they weren't really given the platform or the credit that they deserved. So I think that um, uh, public enemy Chuck B specific kind of went for the highest profile artist that the world can sort of um, recognize. And by using a personality such as Elvis, you are practically sending a global shockwave, you know, throughout. The community. Exactly. 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 Are you not a patriot? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, not, not just people in the US can identify with Elvis. I mean, my mom's a massive Elvis fan, and we shared that if there wasn't so much trouble. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so that's just the sort of my take on why we love the Elvis. So, cultural appropriation is what they're speaking to. At the time, perhaps, not many scholars would be speaking about Elvis in relation to arguments about cultural appropriation, but that's what it was many people would say today. That, you know, the moment, the way to ensure the crossover appeal of black cultural expression is to have a white artist step up and, 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 and embrace it, and take it to that white majority paying audience. That's how you make things go mainstream. So, rhythm and blues artists, it is the definition. Of, of music genres is how it happened. White artists doing this thing were, 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 were placed in the rock and roll section. Black artists doing this thing were ghettoized in the rhythm and blues section. Right? Um, that's one way. There are many other categories of going to music stores, and even today, uh, it's interesting to see what is classified as just music, rock and roll pop, and what is classified as world music. Not in the States, what is this? Right? So there's a whole curve for the cultural appropriation is one part of it. All this another signifier of the proud American century, glossing over the genocide of indigenous Americans, how this you know American public was established of basically genocide. You know like cultural appropriation, appropriation of land, killing of people, our mass, etc. etc. The Scottish policy today that acknowledges the story. So this the entire genre of lessons is fundamentally racist. So when Johnny Depp goes off and does, you know, a lone ranger, 
He is that person, he is this person with his feathers and his feet. I'm like, I used to eat him like John uh, did. But this doesn't, you know, not quite what eating him with Gil Jay. Far from it. So, what then informs Chuck is thinking is black consciousness thinking. And I'm literally not offering you a Malcolm X or Angela Davis or whatever else quote. I want you to learn to the fact that local artists like Prophet of the City, Black Noise, etc., etc., they were even Bleak Up as well as Marcus Garvey and a lot of other people from other parts of the world. This is how Biko speaks about that consciousness. Really, by understanding yourself as Black, you are starting toward the road to emancipation. You are committed to fight against all those forces that seek to use your Blackness as a stamp that marks you out as a subservient being. And you can tell that he probably was reading Franz Fanon, I think. Oh, no, I don't offer it, let me just get that. No, do I have a Franz Fanon quote? I think I have it later. I don't know what I was thinking. So, let me just say this quickly. A lot of my thinking on, 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 on South African hip hop was informed by our work as social linguists. And one of the things is you know, actual fact, I'm too nervous to say. Um, Another one who became a poor did a lot of research on language, the use of Afrikaans and English, non standard dialects of Afrikaans and English in District 6. Right? District 6, for those of you who know, um, this is a classic song of the album Funk Clover Prophets of the City with the BDD, he's uh, rapping on a song called I Remember District 6. And what he does is he calls his childhood in District 6, <coughs> the moment before everything is taken away from the kids. To me, it's one of the best songs ever produced in the 90s. And um, this is the research that Kevin Porter does to sort of validate the dialects of people spoken in those spaces, to, to, to record them, because they're literally not just physical spaces that they were obliterated, but the modes of speech, the customs, the traditions, the history of those, those things are also obliterated. So museums like the 66 Museum are vital. Uh, in, 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 in capturing that moment, but also certain kinds of hip hop like POCs, I mean, it's, it's a classic song. Um, and what they do, what Prophets of the City are doing through their use of the non standardized English Afrikaans, largely Afrikaans, but not exclusively, is to claim what it means to be black in Afrikaans, to claim it. Yes, color is an identity, but it, color is a social construction like white and black, right? Um, the side color was used to construct a narrative of different kinds of people, people who would not think of themselves as black, so that we may divide and rule the country. It's called up a set of people as colored so that they don't unite with the broader category of black people. In other words, so they don't try to see people who are thinking about blackness. Blackness is an ideological statement more than a statement that is founded in biological extensions thinking on identity. So he's rejecting essentialism. Essentialism is making a uh, political play. So Nietzsche, in our sense, is um, rejects biological essentialism, understands of race and language as well. Um, and she talks about race as social, social construction. And a lot of my research taps into Zimitri's thinking on racial identity as well. So this brings us to POC. POC uses Afrikaans. He started his thought of as a signifier of humness, right? of being the sons of hand, of being colored, the mark of shame. We are tainted, half bloods. Think about all the ethnic stuff. It just goes down here. Double tea party on some racial identity. They take that and they say, we're going to take that, we're not going to reject off your cards, that's who we are. So we need to mash that up with that consciousness that being colored is kind of black. We black and we, we speak out of being a problem. Apologies for you defending you, that this is who we are. This brings us to the song Black Thing. Do you have any chance of it? Yes. <laughs> um, I think, do you want to talk to this? This, um, should I read it out to you? I know this is probably Shane's lyrics, he probably wrote it, but, but I'm sure you, you also have a verse in here, yeah, I think. Do you want to talk to the thinking on this? This is from an album called Funk flow. And should I just read it quickly? The term colored is a desperate case of how the devils divided us by calling us a separate race. Lined up. They call me colored since my blood isn't pure, Virginia. I'm not lacking insecurity. I'm going to stop there because Shane is much better at this than me.
and get to that my mental state with black consciousness, let's just stop there and explode those lyrics. Do you want to speak to that? Do you remember this at all? Burning <laughs> 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 connection. That's how you can know it. So basically, you know, could each one teach what ethos of the time. Uh, the facts of the United in fact, front, the actors on the on the ground. Excuse me, I don't get okay, just pause for a second. Yeah, what what? <coughs> It's going to take a minute. <laughs> One of the reasons why we felt very strong about writing that particular song in that particular manner as well is because we used to receive a lot of um, sort of harsh remarks and criticism from our own communities, our own families as well. You know, going through this um, transformation and kind of being more aware, you know, of your surroundings, the circumstance, and having a better understanding of. Uh, the history, you know, it's something that I was completely oblivious to, completely ignorant. Um, Shaheen was more political, uh, politically minded than me, you know, because he was on the SRC, he used to join all the rallies and all these things. <clears throat> From my perspective, it's the typical brother grew up on the Cape Flats, I do what young boys did on the Cape Flats, you know, that's not many of those things, that's what we call it, hip hop you know. So my, my intention and my motivation was slightly different as well. So kind of finding myself on this consciousness political path is something that I didn't quite understand. We didn't sit in the room and we didn't say, this is the formula, this is the lyrics, I'm reading this book or I've uncovered this. Everything, it was, it, it came from, I would say, a very, it came from, from, from a very sort of honest, Space, whether we were contradicting ourselves at the time, or maybe we made sense, or maybe we didn't make sense. Um, just from my perspective, once again, I just felt that, that we needed to do something like this, and I needed to kind of tell my community this is exactly how I feel, you know, being put in this position, and now you're covering all this new information. And if you look at the politics, and if you look at the social, the social condition at the time, um, we received a lot of criticism. You know, from our own communities, especially so people who self-identify as colored and didn't buy this whole black consciousness. Why do you become colored? What's that about? It's because of the, you know, the, the whole divide and conquer rule, you know, and our deeply rooted segregation, you know, was in the country and so is, you know, through politics, through religion, through traditions and all those type of things. So for a colored boy to call himself black, it's like, brah, so is he a dark in the room? You know, so that was the attitude. Who can tell us here is a kafir? You know, that was the attitude. So we're like, you don't quite understand what we're trying to say. Uh, you, you, you don't quite get to understand what we're trying to say. And at that point in time, trying to communicate with those in your immediate circle was extremely difficult because you could understand the National Party had such a grip you know, on our communities. And if you look at the history in terms of how um, we've been conditioned. You know, it just doesn't come on from 10 years, 20 years, we're going down to hundreds of years, you know, with influence coming in from um, other uh, sort of nations that have perfected the art of, um, uh, the, the art of subduing people through the ages, you know, so these are the pieces that we are left to pick up and this is, you know, it's created a lot of confrontation and conflict on so many levels and that's kind of what led to this. <coughs> That concludes that section. Straight from the walls of mind. So basically, the challenging internalization, the way people internalize the part that thinking about identity. What's cool for me, I mean, this part of the English, but a lot of, actually, it's kind of in non standard language in English, and yuck it isn't uh, an English word. Um, what does yuck mean? What does it mean to yuck your insecurity? Um, yuck, it uh, depends on <coughs> which context you use that. You know, yuck means. Um, if you're nicely dressed, you know, like, today, for instance, I'm kayak, this is my best Italian. Sometimes the group is a slap because they're yaki, because they're dressed, but that's a yaki move, you know, so it's that kind of attitude. I'm in there, I'm going to do it. Or, if you use it in a different context, and you could say, yo, my bro, he does no net kayak. It means that somebody had, somebody overpowered you, you know, or somebody conned you, or somebody persuaded you to do or say something against the world. So it totally depends, you know, in, in which context you use. So what we've been talking about through the refusal to be interpolated as color and identify with black consciousness ideology is basically talking about gestures, gestures of refusal here. Um, 
challenging the HMR discourses. And I think the best example, the best link would be Franz Fanon, in Black Skins, White Box, who talks about the way in which you experience as an Algerian coming to France, walking the streets of, 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 of Paris, um, having to negotiate racial interpretation in its crudest form, the way in which the racist discourse objectifies you. Uh, it uses you to an object amongst objects. Um, and this idea is, is, is this sort of consciousness of the way, the way in which the colonizer actually views you, sees you, creates sort of a split, a fragmentation of the subject, you would argue. I mean, really, really crude here. There's more about this in static, my second book. A free download, you don't have to spend a set, download it, Google it, static, but you know, you, you. Um, <laughs> What I do there is I create a link to to what? Double consciousness. The idea of measuring yourself by the tape of the colonial master. And this is the best, one of the coolest quotes. This quote, follow closely by it. This quote is one of the nicest things for me. It's, 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 a, peculiar, it's a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness. The sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of the world that looks on in the news, content and pity. What POC does is they refuse that. I refuse to measure myself by your tape. I will not live my life according to your standards. I do not seek your approval to be validated as a full human being. Right? The terms are mine. You'll do this on my terms. That's what made public enemy and POC in their time. Made them scary. Right? There was a lot of media hoo-ha, mainstream media, not just talking about Fox. Did Fox exist 10 years ago? Um, the way they were vilified. Of course, Flavor Flav did it properly, he just gave them a lot of ammo. But the sort of militant message was his position as militant, as aggressive, but coming for us. The black pale, right? That kind of militant message, um, well, that kind of message, an assertive message, was characterized as militant. That's how interpolation works, right? You position people through discourses. So you're not an assertive person, you can be expected as a full human being. Right? You're militant. You're aggressive. Right? You're the angry black man in the room. Okay? In other words, you're getting a lot of noise. There's that word again, noise, rupture, breaking the PA. So you should know, it was in 1994, I thought I was going to be the first person to look at POC's work, and look at public enemy's work, and recognize big pictures, arguments about subculture. Then she publishes this book called Black Noise. And I'm like, Black noise, like as an Indian's black noise? What is going on? And I'm reading this book and I'm like, she's quoting Nick Hembridge. So that was the first to publish using Nick Hembridge and making the name. So she says, quoting, you know, drawing on Hembridge, it's a book called Subculture of the Meaning of Style. Style can be used as a gesture of refusal, or as a form of oblique challenge to structures of domination. Hip hop artists use style as a form of identity formation that plays on class distinctions and hierarchies by using commodities to claim the culture today. Was right? And this is Hempage himself. Hempage says subcultures represent noise, literally. Interference in the orderly sequence which leads from real events and phenomena to the representation of the media. So from the actual event to its representation of the media, they come in and actually sample that media, appropriate it, deconstruct it, and produce a counter message. That's what they do. Linguistically, through the appropriation of public spaces, black artists or b-boys, b-boying in public spaces, all as MCs, etc., etc. Right now, you have in places like Oakland, b-boys performing in public spaces and people recording it. And that is the protest and the cops. It's the opportunity for the cops to come along and harass these black men dancing on the sidewalk. It still is vital. So as much as people talk about hip hop's commodification, MTV, etc., etc., on the streets, hip hop is still a vehicle to appropriate space to make political statements um, as well as aesthetic ones. So as we get to time, subculture speaks through mornings, right? It allows our sense of what is normal contradicts of our consensus about what is normal, right? And if it's true that subcultures speak to commodities, if it's true that if it's true that appropriate signs of commodities, etc., etc., then 
equation is if it does so, can it be co-opted, which comes back to your question. And the answer is yes, it can be co-opted, it is being co-opted, as other kinds of subcultures have been co-opted, commercially and ideologically. And that's what I want us to talk about a bit about a bit of more on Wednesday. Tomorrow I want to really talk about this hip hop in South Africa specifically and set up for those of us who remember the 80s and remember other kinds of cultural expression reading that time, I wanted to just sort of show you one or two poems that help create a sense of the backdrop for POC's entry into hip hop. Um, and on that note, any closing sentiments, remarks at this point? Gestures of refusal? <laughs> I just want to say thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for attending. Thanks for the interest. Um, I never thought that uh, such a deep academic approach would be taken on, you know, on this culture, hip hop. And um, I, I've just, I'm, I'm sitting over here now, you know, somebody at just a bunk school on a regular basis and they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and now, I now understand the value of having, you know, that